There it is, right there. This is the normal water. I had some out. Is this the normal water or the other water? Normal water, good. <laughs> See, the other thing is do not put uh, Vaseline on the skin. Only if the patient has eyebrows, okay? Not on the skin. You will not record the detail. Okay, here we go. Is that okay? A little sensitive? That's enough. Right there. Just right there. Okay. Now we take the gauze and just embed it like so. One more piece will do. On the outside there, right there. Where's the Q-tip? Got a Q-tip here? There it is. That's enough. Well, you don't need that. So while it's setting here, you got plenty of time. Here. Just make sure that the gauze is nicely adapted. Now, the adhesive. What's the purpose of the trade, is it? It sticks to the plaster a little bit better. Just a little bit. enhances the retention. Okay, who's ready to, who's ready to uh, mix the plaster? You ready? There you go. It's right here. It's, we got the brush. No, it's a big one. Where's, where is the big one? There it is right there. Okay. Now where's the water? This is the good water, okay? Okay, go ahead, mix. No, no, the, the fast setting, this is normal, this is the real water. No, no, we can keep the saline. Yeah, yeah, we, we're going to, we're going to, uh, five minutes is too long. Here, let me mix. I know how to mix this stuff. Give me some more plaster, please. Keep going. Oh, well, hold it a second. Okay, that's good. See how fast this is. Okay, where's the brush? Here it is. So you take the brush and just a thin layer. This is setting real fast, which is great. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't five minutes. Okay, let's do another one here. Another one. Yeah. Yeah, let's, uh, okay, go ahead and mix another one. Clean this bowl, somebody, because we're going to need it again. Okay, mix, mix, mix. Let me mix again, because I can mix it faster. Now I know how fast. You have to do everything on your own. Okay? You want to do maxillofacial, get your hands dirty. Well, that's for sure. We can't dele delegate much of this stuff. You have a good assistant. I have a perfect assistant that knows exactly what I want. Yeah. And uh, what happened to the big... Okay, now this is just right. So now we just paint it.
Now we let that set. You can clean that out. Now we don't need the brush anymore. Now we can apply it with uh, a tongue blade. Where's the other tongue blade? Yeah. Well, heavy body distorts the tissue. No, if, it, if, if the light body is completely set, fine. But Once everything sets, well, they haven't read the book. I think. <laughs> you know, anything you, you know, the heavier and thicker the, the impression material, the more distortion of the tissue. So when you're using, say, a little light body and then you inject some heavy body, you've combined both of them, and now the thickness of that material is going to weigh on the tissue and it's going to push the tissue. So when this gets hard, then, it's, then, you're, then you can apply anything you want. But you have to wait for that to get hard. And so this has to be thin. I don't think silicone is pretty thin. And uh, so... You know, we don't, we would not use a medium body material to start with. When you mix light and medium, it becomes medium, in, in a sense, because of the thickness and weight of the material. So that's not going to work. Not a good idea. With the what? It's, it's not, uh, not, not applicable, doesn't matter. The impression, the accuracy of the impression material doesn't have any impact on this at all. You know, that's clinically significant. Let me ask you the question, when you're, make, when you're making impl impressions of implants, does it matter what kind of impression material you use? It doesn't matter one bit. It has no impact. When you're doing a big phase, fixed case with implants, you're, what are you doing? You're splitting them together with pattern resin or something similar. And so, who cares what kind of impression material you use? I use polysulfide. Why? Sure. Why? Because it's cheaper. <laughs> you know, I make, a, I make a full arch impression, it's $50. If I use a polysulfide impression, it's 5 And the accuracy is dependent upon the securing these them together, right? It's the same thing here, basically. You know, if you want to pay fifty dollars all the time, no problem. I don't have any problem with you. The, 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 well, no, I wouldn't use polysulfide for front bridge impression. It's just not as accurate. Um, you know, when I was going through dental school, that's the only impression material we had. Actually, we used the silicones were hadn't been in, refined yet, so everything was polysulfide. And you had to be very careful the way you used it, because if it snapped out of an undercut, it would destroy all kinds of stuff. And so the silicones are much, much more accurate. But you know, your the accuracy of this is dependent upon the thickness of the material, not the accuracy. And the same thing when you're making an impression, you know, your the impression material is just just determining the soft tissue contours. So I use the cheapest material I can. <laughs> of course, I had to. I had to think about those things when I was. See, now it's set. Now we can add whatever we want. So mix me some more. Now you can mix. Just a normal mix. <laughs> okay. So how are you doing? Okay. Is she doing okay? Okay. Good. You can't smile now. No, no more smiling for a while. Distorts the impression. Well, now you can. But when the impression was made, we don't want any smiling. Okay, that's enough. Just, just mix it. Good. You done? Good, that's enough. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> so now, you can take some here too, Jacob. You apply to wherever, around the edges. See, the tongue blades aren't as good as a spatula. 
little bit, it's okay. Now you can apply as much as you want, and you won't distort the impression. So I'm just leave, let that set a little bit. Why can't we just do two four instead of three? What do you mean two pourings? Two layers instead of three layers. We need it thick enough so it doesn't break. hard what before it's set. It just because you start pushing it around. You saw how we were pushing it around and it would thin out. I don't need that, no. I just need another mix of plaster. See this will set really fast now because it's sitting on top of the plaster that's already set. So technically you could just <laughs> Yeah you can make it very thick, as thick as you need to just to and then we'll pull it off. Same mix as last time, okay? We didn't make an impression of the opposite eye. You don't need to do that. It doesn't really help you at all. Because you're not going to position the globe on the cast, you're going to position it on the patient. You can't. Because you, you know, it, it's, it doesn't work. If you, okay, if you want to, it's like using a computer if you want to, but I never use the cast. I do it always on the patient. your fault. <laughs> well, now you're thinning the edge. No, you want it thick out there because you're going to grab a hold of that part and then <laughs> so it'll be set here in about five minutes. So once we Okay, let's go back to the slides. Slides? Whoever's controlling. Find in the patient. And so you can't always use them. Sometimes you have to make them customized. So you get the right spherical dimension. Because if the, if the globe is too small, when you go to sculpt, the orbital prosthesis and the lid contours, the scleral show, or the white of the eye that shows, will be too small. And that's exactly what happened with this patient. We picked out a globe, and the globe's too small. And so when we try to sculpt and, and develop the scleral show, what 
the white of your eye that shows, particularly in the lateral aspect, it doesn't show enough. So we don't have a globe here that fits this patient, unfortunately. So sometimes you have to custom make them in order to have a globe of the right spherical dimension. So the, all, all these little things <laughs> go into making a successful prosthesis. It's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. So it's actually, it was, this isn't quite set yet, but it, actually it's, uh, this patient was a perfect patient, really, to demonstrate on because the globes, the globes were too small and we couldn't quite do what we wanted and the prosthetic space was not sufficient. And so you'll see when I try on the sculpting that it doesn't really look real. And it's because of the lack of depth. We couldn't create the depth and the shadows and around the eye that, that she has on the opposite side. And the globe is so small that we can't show the scleral part of the eye laterally, the way she does with her normal eye. So everything has to be perfect for an orbital prosthesis to work properly and to look good. And the pictures I've shown you, those are perfect cases. It has to be perfect. And we teach the residents in our program how to do this. And uh, I'd say about half the cases that I showed you are my own and the other half are by the residents. And usually it's third, you know, they, only, they don't do a lot of them. They come in and do three or four while they're in training. But you can teach anyone to do this properly if, you, if they follow the right steps and do the things you're supposed to do. See, so. Then what we do is we select a globe. This is a flashlight. It's one of these modern flashlights. So you stick it in somebody's eye and they close. So you need a, not a very uh, prominent light source to do this, because the patient has to keep their eye open in a normal position while you're doing this. So you need a light source. You cannot do this without a light source. It's the only way I know of to position the globe properly. And we're gonna use Dr. Jacob's phone for that purpose. Let's see if this is <laughs> setting. Yeah, it's uh, starting to get there. It's another five minutes. <laughs> it's starting to warm up a little bit. So at any rate, the globe has to be perfectly positioned. And then you want to look at it from various perspectives. You don't want to start sculpting, doing a lot of lid sculpting like this until you've got the globe where, exactly where you want it. And so, the first step I like to do is to just apply a little bit of wax to create the semblance of lid. And that also is helpful in determining whether the globe is in the right position. And once I've determined that it's in the right position, then you can add the rest of the wax and develop the contours of the soft tissues. But you don't want to do that until you've perfectly positioned the globe. Okay, let's see what it is now. <laughs> yeah, this is ready. So now wiggle, have her wiggle her forehead. Wiggle her forehead, open and close her eyes, smile, open and close her jaw. So we just sort of loosen it. Uh, I need to sit down here. What, give me the chair, please. Put the camera over here. I'm too old to do this stuff anymore. Ever wiggle her forehead a little bit? Just wiggle. No, 
Okay. So here's our impression. It looks very good. So whatever you want. <laughs> now somebody clean her up. So we need to get her cleaned up a little bit. Okay, now I need the torch lit. You want to get rid of all of this stuff that we're not using. Okay, get rid of all of this. We don't want that. Uh, see, that's our marker. Okay, so let's get rid of all this stuff. Put that here. Go ahead and clean her up. Thank you, you're a good patient. A lot cooler in here, it should be a lot easier. <laughs> That's for sure. Over there, camera. Over there, stay there, <laughs> don't move. You don't need to take a picture of this yet. I'll tell you when to take a picture, okay? Okay, we're all cleaned up. Where's that glow? Okay. Now, go ahead and take a picture of this globe right here. Okay, see this globe? It's been cut down quite a bit from what you normally would see. Give me the box of globes. Where'd it go? There we go. Open it up for me. Whoops. <laughs> Just give me one. You can see here, when we started, we had a you know something really big. But this is too big. This this one is too big to fit within within the orbital content. So you have, generally have to cut it back quite a bit so you end up with something like that. And then you take some wax. So you need to use hard modeling wax, not normal wax. Okay, Cabot, you get um, extra hardened wax sheets. Yeah, the harder the wax, the better it is. You know, you almost want something like inlay wax. You know, something similar to inlay wax. Now, the next thing you do, now you can focus on the patient, okay, is you take a tongue blade, get, uh, let's go, hit right over my right shoulder here. I'll try to stay out of the way. Okay, there we go. That's good. You take a tongue blade, and you make a mark on the tongue blade, and you put that mark right in the center of the midline, and then you make a mark where you think the pupil is on the right side, and then you make an equivalent mark on the other side. So now you know where the globe is going to go, pretty much. See that? So now you want to put the globe where the pupil is right, comparable to that mark, 
And first, what did I say? I need to generally move the eye a little bit medium to make it look normal. Because her the side of her face here, you can see the contour is not as prominent on this side as it is on this side. So if you put the globe in the, wrong, in the same position, it'll look like it's too far out to the side. Okay, so, let's take some wax here, ready? We've adapted wax to the defect, we made a, a model made previously, and we take our our tongue blade, position it, holding that in position. So let's turn it over a little bit, put it right there. So I make a mark laterally, and I make a mark right there, make a mark right there, make a mark right there. Okay. And that gives me a, a if you want to look at this, here we've got a little mark here, see here, and a little mark there, and a little mark there, and a little mark there. Now, I have at least a guide to help me initially position the globe. Okay, so let's go over here. Okay. There we go. So this is the cast. Uh, him. <laughs> this is the camera. There you go. So you can see this mark, and this mark, this mark. Let's soften up the wax a little bit. And we'll just put the globe in a position that's reasonably comparable to that. You see, this is why you need a hole in the back, so you can take your finger through there, and you can <coughs> manipulate it, move it around easily. So the wax that Dr. Buman is using inside is your beading wax? The real soft wax. So you can move things around. Now, let's take a look here. You can see that the globe is about the right level. Let's get your phone up, Jacob. But it's looking, can you get, turn your head just like that. It's looking to the, to the left. <laughs> you see, the globe doesn't. So, you can see the, the, the little light, and look, you see that, it's, let me see, the light is shining right here. The pupil is there, so I have to turn the globe so it looks straight on. So let's see if we can do that. You put it back on the fast, like this, and then move it out. When the wax is soft like this, you can move the globe around. And let's try it back on again. You can see here, it's starting to get into a better position. But it's still looking a little to the right and a little bit up. So let's... Move it again. So you keep moving it around until you get the globe so it looks... When she looks straight at you, the globe looks straight at you. Look me. Okay, shine your light for me, Jacob. Let's get it right here. Okay, still looking up a little bit. See that light, that light is a little bit on the bottom side? You see how you can see that? You can see it right there. Okay. Okay, let's shine the light. Now that's looking pretty good, isn't it? Can you see that, Jacob? Oh, yeah. Well, we had light. We could see. Yesterday we were working in the dark. So the most difficult part is positioning. If you don't get that right, don't repeat. <laughs> that's, that's simple. Oh, here we go. Now let's just melt 
the little wax in here so that it doesn't move around on us too much. Again, the big problem we're going to have is the lateral extent of the sclero. You, you can see that? You can't hardly even see it now. It's just way too small. These things are just not big enough. Right on, see what we got. Where's this, this thing? Okay. Let's see. <laughs> oh, let's see, the globe is not too bad. I don't have the lids right, but.
develop the contour of the lid opening. Down. Now let's put it back on and we'll start to develop the cut. No. So you can see here this lid is not anywhere near correct. So this has to go like this. Sort of push the wax around. Oops, just a little too much there. And then you start to develop some contours here. Now the problem with this defect is that there's not enough depth on the medial side here. Let me show you that. That's a good one. It is to first to develop the position of the medial canthus and the lateral canthus. So you look, you say, where's the medial canthus? Well, it's supposed to be right there. You had it a little bit too low to begin with. And then the lateral is about right there. So once you have the medial and lateral campus, then you can start with the, the lid contours. <coughs> so we'll do the lid contours here in a little bit, and then I'll show you a sculpting that we worked on yesterday, because we worked on a lot of con on the, the suborbital and superorbital contours.
Okay, let's try this on. Why don't you wait till I get in there, then you can move that. So now you, we're starting to develop some lid covers. Look me, look right there. It's starting to look like it's supposed to. Take it to about there. And then you continue to sculpt until you develop more contour. And that took me a couple of hours to go from there to there. Now this sculpture is, it's okay, but the problem is the depth. I can't get the globe far enough back. So I don't know if you can see that. It's hard because there's a big shadow there, but um, the big problem is the skin is right there, right here. And the globe has to go back a good, oh, I would say two millimeters in order to create the depth in this area here that she has on the opposite side. It's hard to see that on the picture. Well, you're starting to see it now, but you see the big uh, shadow that she has on this side? We can't recreate that if we don't have the depth. I can try to paint that into the, <laughs> into the uh, prosthesis, but it really won't look very good unless you have the actual same depth here as you have here. And then the other problem with this is that you don't see a lot of the white of the eye laterally. And the reason for that is the globe, the sphere of the globe is too small. We didn't have a globe that was quite big enough for her. And so all these little things make a difference. You know, this, this is a reasonable sculpting, but the eye opening looks too small. And the reason it looks too small is because the globe is too small. So the, the, the size of the sphere ha has to be a little bigger, actually, than the actual eye. That's why a lot of these stock eyes don't work very well, because they're too small. So you have to alter them. You can alter them. You can uh, alter them, or you can make a new one. It's, it's easier, actually, to al alter them, because then you don't have to paint the iris or anything like that. But uh, that's, that's a, a significant problem with this particular one because the globe's too small. So you'd have to cut cut back the clear resin and then just uh, invest, add wax, invest, like, let's go back here. We go back to the slides. I'm gonna look. You can see the globe is looking a little lateral. So I will be, I would be able to gain a little sclera. Remember I was telling you about that? I would be able to gain, gain a little bit of scleral show by rotating it a little bit. Shall we try it? I might mess everything up, but I might as well try it. Okay. So the way you do that, <laughs> well, Often I run into this problem when I'm in the clinic, so I, I always have a water bath. So I stick the wax in the water bath and get it so it's molten a little bit, and then you can move the globe around without messing up your sculpture. But with this, <laughs> it's almost impossible. So let me see what I can do here. Uh, well, I'll just do it from here and see what happens. I'll try not mess it up too much here. That's all right. So 
This is why it's so important to have a big hole in the back of Well, I really can't get the wax warm enough. It's too, uh, but that's how you would do it in the clinic. You would stick it in a water bath for, oh, 30 seconds or a minute, and then that will evenly heat the wax. And then you can carefully rotate a little bit. As this one, this wasn't quite, the globe wasn't quite right. And so by moving it this way, you'll have more scleral show. Does that make sense? Okay, I think we're finished with the patient. Alrighty, thank you so much. Okay. So we go to the slides again. I'm gonna look. You can see the globe is looking a little lateral. So I will be, I would be able to gain a little scleral. Remember I was telling you about that? I would be able to gain, gain a little bit of scleral show by rotating it a little bit. Shall we try it? I might mess everything up, but I might as well try it. Okay. So the way you do that, <laughs> well, Often I run into this problem when I'm in the clinic, so I, I always have a water bath. So I stick the wax in the water bath and get it so it's molten a little bit, and then you can move the globe around without messing up your sculpture. But with this, <laughs> it's almost impossible. So let me see what I can do here. Uh, well, I'll just do it from here and see what happens. I'll try not mess it up too much here. That's all right. So this is why it's so important to have a big hole in the back of Well, I really can't get the wax warm enough. It's too, uh, but that's how you would do it in the clinic. You would stick it in a water bath for, oh, 30 seconds or a minute, and then that will evenly heat the wax. And then you can carefully rotate a little bit. As this one, this wasn't quite, the globe wasn't quite right. And so by moving it this way, you'll have more scleral show. Does that make sense? Okay, I think we're finished with the patient. Alrighty, thank you so much. Okay. So we go to the slides again. You can race with one eye? He said, yeah, he says, I can. And so nobody ever knew that he had only one eye because of this race. But anyway. Uh, you can see the difference, not much in the way of lines when he's 50, but when he's 60, things change. Now, the purpose of these slides is to show you the way... <clears throat> see, is this going to work? No. Uh, the way the periphery is blended into the t contours of the skin. There should be a nice, smooth transition between the contours of the prosthesis and the skin. There should not be a, an abrupt change in the contour. This smooth, smoothly flow into the contours of the adjacent skin. And then I showed you this slide before. That's all about surface texture, isn't it? And you have to make the surface texture much more prominent in the wax than it is in the skin, because as I said before, you lose some of the detail 
when you apply the extrinsic coloration. So the textures of the sculpting is slightly more prominent than what you see in the skin. And I showed you this before, right? Now you know the answer. Why is what's lacking in this prosthesis is the surface texture of the skin of the suborbital area. Now, I always use synthetic eyelashes for the upper lid, but I always paint them on the lower lid. And you have to be careful about the way you use these eyelashes, because when you get the synthetic eyelashes that the ladies use, they're very thick and prominent. And they're generally new, too prominent. So what you have to do is take a scissors and cut away most of the lash to make it look normal. Because the synthetic ones, the fake ones, are too, there's too much hair. <laughs> and so, you have to be careful about that. So look at this. <laughs> See, these are, they haven't been thin properly. So it's a nice prosthesis. Everything looks great, except the eyelashes are not perfect. <laughs> they have to be thinned out. And you'll notice that uh, well, all the ladies know about eyelashes, the guys don't. Uh, so all the ladies know about eyelashes. They're, there's a single thread and then they're sewn to that thread, right? Well, you have to stick that thread underneath the wax here. See, space was not made for the lash here. There's no space to tuck it underneath the upper lid. So you see this black line, which is not normal. Here, I've stuck the lash, or, or the fake lash, underneath the wax pattern lid to create the space for it. So all you see are the lashes, you don't see that little single line that the lashes are tied to. I don't expect the men to understand what I'm talking about, but the ladies do, right? And then we have a series of shades, I have some up here, and we pick a shade that's the lightest skin color in the adjacent area. You always want to err on the light side because as you add pigmentation, the whole prosthesis will darken. So you add, you pick a shade slightly lighter than what you see, and then you trim the cast and adapt the wax pattern to the cast and you feather the margins. Make it as thin as possible out here as it blends into the natural skin. You can see the way this is feathered in both situations. That's real important. You want very thin margins. And that's one of the advantages of the modern silicones. The tear strength is, is, is very good so you can make the margin very thin. You can make it so you can see right through it, which is nice. Now, we're, you have to understand how to flask one of these things. The technicians don't know how to flask this because they flask dentures, right? So you can't just say flask it. What are we doing here? We're, we're looking through the back and there's a big hole in the back of the cast, right? But we want the prosthesis to engage parts of the defect. That will help stabilize and retain it. So look at the difference between left screen and right screen. We have drawn a line here on where I want the wax to be flowed, and I want a very thin layer of wax here, about a millimeter, millimeter and a half, but that is very flexible. And that area will engage the undercut or other surfaces in the defect and help retain the appliance in place. We're actually looking at the floor. This is the floor of the orbit here. You can't really see it. But the, wax, the, the cast is kind of upside down. And we want to extend the prosthesis onto the floor of the orbit because it helps keep it in position. And then what you do is you add a little adhesive to the top of the appliance and uh, engage the floor of the orbit properly and it'll stay in really well just with adhesive. You don't need implants on these kinds of small defects. So here it is totally flasked. And you separate, 
And you can kind of see the detail associated with the surface texture. And it's much more prominent than what you would see in the skin. And of course you have to paint those lines with dark colors, grays and dark browns, in order to create the semblance of, of the skin folds. And you'll notice that the back of the globe has little buttons, resin buttons on them. And that's to help orient the, the, or keep the globe in proper orientation during the processing. And actually what we do is take a little adhesive cyanoacrylate and glue this to the back side of the cast to keep the globe in position during processing. Otherwise it'll move around on you and uh, the casting won't re be, be accurate. So this, this part is very important right here. And uh, we mix and it's, it's a mixture by eyeball. We, you know, we, we have the shade that we've picked, selected and we add pigment to the point where we create the same shade. So it is somewhat of an, of a, of an art. You know, the, the tech, this is where the technician has to have some experience doing this. Um, and then, preferably, when you mix, you put this in a vacuum somewhere and get all the bubbles out. I know not everybody has a vacuum machine in their lab. So when you're mixing this stuff, you have to be careful not to incorporate too many bubbles in it. Otherwise you have a porous uh, material and that can, can negatively impact the quality of the casting that you get. So here we have a, we're just, we just inject into the mold with a, with a disposable syringe, add extra, close the mold. You don't have to put a lot of pressure, you just have to close it. It's not like you're compressing resin or anything, you're just having excess. You have a little reservoir out laterally. See this reservoir out laterally beyond the margins of the appliance? So you want to have enough so that it fills the reservoir. So you have no voids. And here's the finished casting from the back and the reservoir is all filled up. It's kind of like the same thing, you know, we do the same thing when we pack and test dentures, right? Same, same idea. I don't know, anybody pack and test dentures anymore in this? We used to make the students do that. Not anymore. But here, here's the finished appliance. And now you're going to paint it. it. Takes about a week for, after you paint, for the silicone to polymerize. So, uh, when you're painting extrinsically, you want to keep the, the solutions as thin and as least viscous as possible. If, if the mix, and we, we painted, paint basically with a mixture of silicone adhesive. And, you, we dilute the silicone to make it as watery as possible so that the, we don't fill up all the pores and the surface texture is not obliterated. So that's really important. You want to avoid the use of excessively thick material while you're painting, while you're mixing your paints. And then you seal it with an auto polymerizing silicone. And then you have to degloss this. When you seal, the, sh the surface will be excessively shiny. And so you have to use a, a, a material to, to eliminate that shininess, or at least moderate it somewhat. It knows this sometimes will we'll let it still shine on the, on the uh, nostrils a little bit, and maybe the tip, because a lot of older people have a lot of secretions. The basic secretions in their nose shine a little bit. Uh, you don't, you don't, you don't want to do too much elimination of the shine, and it's just the right amount, and that should be done in the presence of the patient. And then this is an example of intrinsic coloration. So you can see the area around the lids were colored, a little darker color to match the opposite side. But that's very tedious. You have to 
apply the silicone and the colorants and let it set a little bit. It has to polymerize a little bit before you can add additional layers on it. That's why it takes so long. When you're applying extrinsic coloration, just apply, 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 you can do that in 10, 15 minutes, you're done. But when you're doing next intrinsic, you have to let some of this polymerize a little bit, otherwise the stuff starts to move around and it doesn't stay where you want it. As I said, upper eyelashes, we, uh, we use synthetic eyelashes for the upper only. And because if you lose synthetic, use synthetic eyelashes on the lower, they become too prominent. Most of the, even in the ladies, the lower eyelashes are not prominent. And so we paint the lower lid. So, like these are painted. Those are painted. And you can see the mucosa, the pink mucosa of the lower lid. When you use the synthetic ones, you cover up all that pink mucosa of the lower lid. So it doesn't look not natural, does it? So we always paint the lower lashes, use synthetic ones underneath the upper lip for the upper lashes. It's these little details that make the difference. Everything has to be perfect if you're going to make one of these. Oops, did I go the wrong way? Yeah, I did. And we've talked about this before. Whoops. And here's some completed cases. I've shown you this before. And this is the Long Beach Grand Prix racing driver. <laughs> so the eyelashes are painted on the eyelashes are painted on the lower lid and synthetic eyelashes are used for the upper lid. Here's another this is one of the residents did this case. One of our residents a couple of years ago did this case. It's a really nice outcome. Here's another couple of outcomes. This uh, shows you the value of shaded lenses. And we use a lot of shaded lenses to help camouflage the appliance. And when you have a shaded lens like this, you can't tell that the face is you know, wearing a prosthesis at all. Let's see, where am I? Okay, so we're going to take another about, let's see, we have, uh, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, of course, I can have, uh, I'll entertain questions now, whatever it is. <laughs> they paint their eyebrows and we would do the same thing for this. If it's a man, then uh, you would probably either uh, send the patient to someone who can make a synthetic eyebrow. We have people in Los Angeles that work with the movie industry and they make mustaches for us and they make synthetic eyebrows that you can uh, uh, apply to the prosthesis with adhesive and then take it out and clean it and remove it as you need to. So you can do that. So, yeah, we've done everything, but that, we don't do that anymore. We used to, but not anymore. Not often. Anymore. Did you not say you can choose the they can function with an appliance. You saw her, she had a maxillectomy, so half her upper jaw is gone. Um, and she has a big orbital prosthesis. And I don't think any of you could probably tell from the, the movie that she had had a large orbital prosthesis. And so this is the kind of outcome that you would expect if you're going to provide this kind of service. And this is the, this is where you should try to achieve, the level that you should try to achieve. Here's another one. This is a lady I did, oh, quite a few years ago. One implant is all it took to hold everything together. Because you're connecting the orbit, the facial, to the appliance. It all comes together, and it's, it's like a clamp. It stays together with one implant. So it doesn't take a lot if you engineer these things properly. This is Dr. Hamada's patient. 
that he did when he was a resident. And you can see the way everything is united together. And this is Dr. Romanus' patient. I've shown you here before. This is a patient of mine that I've done. And you can see the quality of the outcome. You do the same basic steps that you would do for any facial. Make impressions, make wax ups, finish the appliance, and that's what you've got with implant retained appliances. So you're restoring these people's lives. They can wear these appliances. The, 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 the retention is sufficient to keep the appliance in position. There's a lady I did for, I don't know, 15 years ago. Just a couple of implants is all it takes. This is a, a person done 30 years ago in the UCLA clinic. And this guy didn't really use his appliance very much because it was not retained with implants. It was retained by uh, means of adhesive and it's just not enough to hold a big appliance in place. So what did he do? We made an eye patch to hold it in position. Today you don't need to do those kinds of things with implants. So you put the implants in at the time of tumor resection. I showed you this case before. Uh, the flaps sometimes need to be debulked. So this flap is too bulbous, so we, this part is debulked to create space for the orbital appliance. This is one of Dr. Giannini's cases. Here's the implants and the finished appliance. So you have a chance of, of really doing some pretty significant things with implants and big facial prostheses. So, we are finished, and I am ready to answer any questions you might have.